So I'm going to ask everybody to stand up. We are going to do Jez Humble's Continuous Integration Test. So I want you to stay standing up if you do continuous integration where you work. Amazing. Fantastic. Right. OK. So stay standing if everybody on your team commits and pushes to a shared main source code branch at least daily. OK? Now, remain standing if every one of those commits causes an automated build and test. Amazing. OK? Nearly all still standing. Now, stay standing if, when the build fails, it's usually back to green within 10 minutes. OK. So, according to the, the, anybody still standing, well done, you are doing continuous integration. <laughs> and you can sit down. So, according to Jez, if you don't pass those tests, you're not doing continuous integration. So, um, continuous integration, every developer commits at least daily to a shared main branch. Every commit triggers an automated build and test. And if the build and test fails, it's repaired within 10 minutes. So um, that's from Martin Fowler's site. Um, and that's what they meant when they said continuous integration. So this is from um, Extreme Programming Explained, 1999, Kent Beck. Um, this was when they first defined the term continuous integration. No code sits unintegrated for more than a couple of hours. And I would say, ideally, every few minutes you're integrating. At the end of every development episode, the code is integrated with the latest release. So not with your feature branch with the main branch, with the main source code. Because what you're doing is you're integrating your code with your colleagues' code, all of it. That's what continuous integration originally meant. But now we have CI servers, which uh, CI stands for continuous integration, right? But uh, quite frequently, I would even say typically, those CI servers are working off a feature branch not off the main branch. So you're not integrating your code with the rest of your colleagues. And you might say to me, oh, yes, but I pull all the time. I'm constantly pulling from the main branch and merging it into my feature branch. But unless all of your colleagues are pushing from their feature branches to that main branch, you are not merging with their code, so you're not integrating with their code, so you're not doing continuous integration. Right. I mean, I'm not here to give you a hard time. <laughs> um, it, you, you do what you do. People have reasons for doing the things that they do. But I'm arguing that's what continuous integration is. It's worth me talking about the difference between continuous integration and continuous delivery. Um, continuous delivery means that it's going all the way to the end user. It's going all the way to prod every few minutes, at least every couple of hours. You can do continuous integration without doing continuous delivery. I would argue if you're going to do continuous integration, go all the way. Do continuous delivery. But there are reasons. There are industries. There are circumstances. There are reasons why you might be able to do continuous integration but not continuous delivery. And anyway, it's worth me defining my terms. What I'm talking about today is continuous integration. So I'm talking about merging the code that you're writing on with the rest of the code base very frequently, continuously even. Um, so, and I'm also going to argue that trunk-based development is continuous integration. Um, Martin Fowler actually doesn't like the term trunk-based development. Um, that's not fair. He, he, he doesn't, doesn't have a problem with the words 
they are descriptive. It's a nice term. The reason I like it is because it makes it very clear what it's talking about. Um, but what it doesn't like is this idea that we, we stop using the word continuous integration and talk about trunk-based development instead because he doesn't like the semantic diffusion that has happened to the term continuous integration, that it stopped meaning what it originally meant. And out of respect to Kent Beck, he wants us to continue calling it continuous integration. But I'm specifically talking about trunk-based development so that I can be very clear what I mean. Because if I say continuous integration, people will hear what people now call continuous integration, which is not what they originally meant when they defined the term. So I'm going to be talking today about trunk-based development. That's what I'm going to call it. And I'm going to argue that if you do trunk-based development, um, things will be better and faster, and you will be happier. Um, so now I'm just going to find my notes for that slide. Hang on a minute. Um, better, faster, happier. So um, with trunk-based development, you get better quality code, faster delivery, and happier developers. Um, happier because better and faster means um, more satisfaction. So your code will be better. Your delivery will be better. Your delivery will be smoother. It will be easier to develop new code. So happier for that reason, um, but also because um, trunk-based development, and I'm going I'm to shorten it to TBD. So if I say TBD, I mean trunk-based development. I might not shorten it very often because the problem is that TBD sounds an awful lot like TDD, uh, and you might not quite be able to hear what I'm saying. So I might just keep saying trunk-based development. Um, but um, what trunk-based development does, it facilitates as well as necessitates better communication and better collaboration. And generally, if you're collaborating well and communicating well, that also makes you happier. OK, but I'm not the boss of you. I can't tell you what to do. I'm not here to tell you off and tell you you're not doing continuous integration properly. I'm here to argue the case for trunk-based development. I'm here to give you reasons for why it's a good idea to aim for it. But you don't have to do what I tell you to do. Um, what I am going to do is I'm going to tell you a story. So um, this book um, by Robert McKee is about how to write good stories. Now, he originally aimed it at screenwriters, uh, but it's also commonly referred to by novelists. And as you heard, I happen to be a novelist. Um, and he goes into some really, really useful techniques for how to tell a good story. And there's one, the one takeaway, because I have a terrible memory, but the one thing he said in the whole book that I've never forgotten is that um, each chunk of your story, so if you're making a film, typically each scene, if you're writing a book, it might be chapters, but your chapters might be split into scenes. Um, but every scene should have a start state, so your protagonist, your main character, will be in a particular state at the start of the scene. And at some point during the scene, there will be a turning point which will make them end up in a different state. Now, the reason I say should is because this is a very good way of holding your audience. This is a very good way of telling a compelling story and making people want to keep turning the pages of the novel or keep watching the film or TV or play or whatever it is. Uh, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you a fictional story about a made-up team that never existed, um, but I'm going to use this story to try and convince you of the benefits of trunk-based development. And so I'm going to try and make every little bit of my story have a start state, a turning point, and an end state um, that will be compelling and help me to make the points that I want to make. I'm going to do it quite fast, because when I first wrote this talk, I had a longer time slot. So apologies if I whiz through it, uh, but I'm really hoping I can get to a point at the end where we can do questions. And then the bits that you didn't quite follow, hopefully you can get at least some opportunity. And if we don't have time for questions at the end, or don't have time for all the questions, do come and find me later. Although, um, spoiler, I do have to leave this afternoon because I'm speaking at another event in London tomorrow. So grab me at lunchtime. <laughs> OK, so um, this imaginary team are working on a brand new piece of software. It's Greenfield. They've, they've been working on it for a few weeks, and they're moving slowly. And they are working in feature branches. 
But one of them reads an article about trunk-based development that says, if you do trunk-based development, you will move more quickly. Now, the problem that they're having is that, that because they're using feature branches, what feature branching does is it introduces queues. So you're always waiting for feature branches to be integrated back into the main line. Maybe you're waiting for them to be tested. Maybe you're waiting for code reviews. Maybe you're waiting for some integration that has to happen. Um, but that introduces queues, and that slows things down. So one of them reads an article that says, if you do trunk-based development, if all of us just constantly push everything we do to the main line, we're not going to have those queues and it's going to speed us up. So they're like, yay, let's do that. And off they go. Uh, but then one of them wants to try something out. They want to do a spike. So they're, they're experimenting with, with a new idea that they've had. And it, it's the new edict is everything is trunk based development, everything goes straight to main. So their experimental code goes into the main code base. And they didn't really quite know what they're doing. It's not very well tested. Everything blows up. So they think, oh, ah, oh OK, yeah, no, wait a minute. So maybe spikes are an exception. We'll do spikes in short-lived branches. Um, so that's the new agreement. But now, but now that they're using short-lived branches, they start using them more and more. And every time there is a branch, when the branch needs to be merged back into the main code base, merge hell. Um, so they're like, oh, yeah, no, OK, yeah, no, that's, that's why we were doing trunk-based development, because we didn't want merge hell. So they go back to it. It's fine. We're no, no branches, no branches allowed. Everything is going to main. OK, but then an auditor pops in and says, <coughs> excuse me, you need code reviews, because this, this um, ISO thing here says we have to do code reviews. Um, and if we don't, we're not compliant. So we now need to develop everything in branches. And then when the branch is finished with, you have to issue a pull request. And then there has to be a code review. And nothing gets to go back into the main branch until all of that has happened. Because otherwise, we're not going to be compliant. OK. So now there's this feeling that, oh, OK, um, I did some work. But I might not have done a very good job of it. Uh, and I really need to check with my colleagues first. And I need to, a PR, and I need a code review. And one of the problems with PRs and code reviews is that if it is your job to review your colleagues' code, you almost feel duty-bound to find something wrong with it. I mean, that's the point, isn't it? Otherwise, you're not doing your job. And people are encouraged to be suspicious of one another's code. People are encouraged to feel insecure about their code. And particularly the newcomers are going to be like, oh, God. And then they'll put off submitting it um, for code review because they fear this moment. Um, and because people, because this whole thing is building up this atmosphere of distrust, people are starting to get more adamant about more things need to be reviewed. We need more pull requests. Uh, and more pull requests means even less trust. So the thing is snowballing now. Like we, we, Everybody is just constantly nitpicking each other's code, and nobody trusts each other to be able to do a good job. More pull requests, more code reviews, more branches, moving even more slowly. Because what we said earlier on about um, the queues, this is increasing the queues. This is also increasing the situation where you finish a piece of work, you have to wait for somebody to review it, but you're not just going to sit there waiting. So you start something new. But then the code review comes back and says that more work is needed, but now you've started something else. So now we have to wait for your attention to come back to the thing to deal with the issues that were raised by the code review. So even more queues, even more bottlenecks, moving even more slowly. Now, it's at this point that I do my spiel about why I don't like code reviews and pull requests. But actually, if you're doing trunk-based development, the whole point is that everything you do gets back into the main line and potentially into prod as quickly and as easily as possible. And if you're waiting for code reviews, if you're waiting for PRs, then you're introducing friction. And you are preventing the continuous 
part of the continuous integration. Uh, and I asked, I used to work for ThoughtWorks, and I'm still in various Slack groups with ex-thought workers. Uh, and, uh, and I asked in one of those Slack groups what people thought about code reviews and pull requests. And I was just <laughs> deluged with people saying, oh, we hate them. Um, so I, and I got some good quotes out of that. So Dan Abel, for instance, said that PR, pull request feedback, is the last point in the dev cycle where feedback is useful and often the most wasteful. So if you do some work in a branch, and then finally, when you think you're finished, you then issue a pull request and start getting feedback. You've already done the work. This is not the point when the feedback is useful. And it is also wasteful because it slows things down. Uh, but that's not the only quote I have. So Keith said, I mean, this is actually, so Keith was in the thread, but this is actually from his book. But in his book, he says, using pull requests for code changes by your own team members is like having your family members go through an airport security checkpoint to enter your home. It's a costly solution to a different problem. Now, um, pull requests were originally conceived of when, uh, uh, as a solution to um, highly distributed teams working on things like open source projects. So open source projects are the exception a lot of the time. So if you are working on a code base that might probably isn't even your full-time job, um, and you have got people contributing to it from all over the world that you have never met, that they are not your team members, you don't know them, and they don't necessarily know your code, pull requests are generally the accepted way of handling that situation, and that is a low-trust environment. You do not know who these people are. That is not a high trust environment. And as I said before, what pull requests do is they increase distrust. Um, Dragan Stepanovich, uh, I, he did a fantastic talk at Newcrafts in Paris a, a few weeks ago. Uh, and the, the link is there, these slides will be shared to a whole article he's written about it. But he did a ton of research on pull requests and how they're handled uh, and what impact they have and how they impact speed and efficiency and how they affect your ability to do a good job. And he's got some really interesting data that he gathered. Um, and one of the things that he discovered is the bigger the pull request, so the bigger the feature branch, the more code is included in that pull request, the more likely it will suffer from the so-called looks good to me syndrome. If the PR is big, reviewers have way less incentive to build in the quality. So there are two issues. One is that if you've got an enormous amount of code and you're asking your colleagues to review it, and they're busy doing other things and they're context switching. And the first problem is, first of all, you've got to get their attention because they're going to be doing other stuff. So there's going to be that delay. Then when you do get their attention, they've now done some context switching. And really, do they want to plow through every single line of your code? The more of it there is, the more likely they're just going to go, ah, oh, looks good to me. It's fine. But interestingly, in the other direction, the less of it there is, the more likely they're going, oh, I don't like that. Uh, and because they think it is their job to find fault, if, the, if it's small enough that they can fit it in their brain, then they will find fault. And they'll nitpick, and they'll hold things up again, because now you've got to respond to that. And you know, a lot of the time, it, that, didn't, that wasn't the right point for that to happen, and it isn't necessarily useful feedback anyway. Um, and finally, we get to the compliance question. So a lot of people will say, we need code reviews, we need branches, we need PRs, because compliance says so. Uh, and th there's a link there to a fantastic article by Dave Farley on continuous compliance. Um, and what he says is that, and this is based on a lot of experience, that my experience across the board has been that regulators prefer these approaches, and he's talking about trunk-based development and continuous integration and continuous delivery, once they come to understand them because they provide a better quality experience all around. So if you read what's actually being said in all of these various regulations. They're not saying you cannot deploy bugs, because we all know you cannot 
completely mandate against bugs. You can make them less likely. Uh, and what the regulators want, what the auditors want, is traceability. They want to know if there are issues, can we tell where they came from? Can we tell how they got there? Um, and what code reviews do is they help you, you believe, to increase quality. The argument that I would make and that Dave makes and that Dragon makes and a bunch of other people is actually they don't increase quality. But that's your goal. And in fact, if you can make changes in really small chunks, and I will talk more about that, then what you're doing is reducing risk if you also have a really good pipeline with automated tests that you trust. So if you have checks and balances, then that means that every commit you make is going through a series of checks and balances. It's going through a pipeline. It's going through, through some automated tests. And that's what continuous compliance is doing. Uh, and you may well have things built into your pipeline that are specific to your situation and whatever regulations you have to comply with. Um, but they are automated rather than holding individuals accountable for being able to do a code review and somehow um, guarantee quality. Whereas actually, it's much better if you can automate that. And uh, one of the things that Dave says in his article is they don't want to be going through a million PRs when they're auditing. That's not helpful to them. They can't tell whether these PRs are any good. They just want reassurance that you have checks and balances in place. And continuous compliance does that for you. OK, uh, he also says, the more complex the compliance mechanisms around change, the lower the quality of the software. Because the more complexity is, there is, the more you're slowing things down the more you're reducing the chance that you can get all the benefits that you get from continuous integration. So he says, I believe that it is not possible to implement a genuinely compliant regulated system in the absence of continuous delivery. OK, so if you want code reviews, then a much better approach to code reviews is to um, review the areas that you're interested in at regular intervals and do it as a team. So regularly review particular areas, maybe a new feature, maybe an area of the code base that's got a lot of traffic at the moment where a lot of changes have happened, but do it holistically. Say, what is the current state of play rather than what change has been made? What lines of code happen to have changed, which is what you do with a PR. Look at the whole thing. So that's one re a more effective way of reviewing code. But an even more effective way, which I forgot to put a slide in for, um, is to be practicing pair programming, mob programming, ensemble work, where every single change to the code has more than one pair of eyes as it happens. So it's being continuously reviewed. And if you're in the habit of doing that, you'll also build up those general collaborative habits of, you know what, if you're a little bit unsure about something you're doing, you pull another of the member of the team over, have a look at this, what do you think about this? And then the great thing about that is that everybody's eyes are on the code more frequently. People are more up to date with what's going on and they're having conversations about it rather than being encouraged to nitpick. Okay, so uh, going back to our fictional scenario, um, they had more PRs, which had increased the lack of trusts, which meant that they were moving even more slowly. And they spot this, and they're like, you know what? This is ridiculous. Trunk-based development is where it's at. That's what we tried all that time ago. We've worked out now. We've read Dave Farley's article. We can do continuous compliance. We don't have to have PRs. So trunk-based development. Now, the reason I've put Big Bang there is this idea we're just going to do it all in a big bang. Like, there's not going to be any preparation. We're just going to do it. Trunk-based development. But now, we can't actually deploy. So what we're, we've managed the continuous integration part of it. Uh, all of our code is going into the main branch. Uh, but we don't currently have automated tests. All of our testing is manual. So we can't deploy it. We can continuously integrate it. But now we have to wait for people to test it. So 
there's another blocker in the way of uh, moving continuously. Um, so because we've got those manual tests, um, but we're trying to do trunk-based development and we want to do continuous delivery as well. So we're going to say, you know what? I mean, those tests, they were just nice to have. We'll just deploy anyway. So they just deploy without tests and guess what? Everything blows up. There's a big system failure. There's a lot of people asking a lot of questions uh, and there's a lot of people who are now getting blamed for this terrible state of affairs. You've broken our product. The whole site has gone down. What on earth are you playing at? Um, and now there's blame, there's guilt, there's shame. And what they realize is, you know what? I mean, one of us once read an article about trunk-based development. We're not really quite sure how to do this well. So finally, they get help. Now, I obviously have an ax to grind here because I'm a technical coach and it is my job to come to your companies and help your teams to learn the skills that they need to do things like trunk-based development. Um, this is Emily Bache, who set up the Saman Technical Coaching Society. Uh, this is her book about technical agile coaching using the Saman method. Um, but what she says in the intro to that book is, in order to be successful in modern development organizations, software developers need new skills. These skills are not easily learned on a short training course or at a university. Practices like continuous integration and test-driven development require developers to change their minute-by-minute -minute habits and ways of working. So if you want to be able to merge the code that you're writing every few minutes, if not every few hours, into, the main, uh, into everybody else's code, you have to work in a different way. And you might not be used to the skills that you need in order to do this. So having a technical coach, having somebody to come and help you build these new muscles and learn these new skills is a very good idea. And I'm also a member of the Saman Technical Coaching Society. Um, so they decide to get help. Um, they, uh, they, maybe they get an external technical coach. Maybe they hire somebody permanently as a technical coach. Maybe they have people within the company that have the skills to come and help their team, this particular team, to learn the skills that they need. Um, but one of the first things that the, uh, the person who they bring in to help does is encourage them to use the MMMSS principle, which I'll explain in a minute, in their journey towards trunk-based development. And as a result, so the idea is don't do a big bang change. Don't say we're just doing trunk-based development right now without having built up all of the scaffolding that we need to make that work. Let's move towards that goal in small steps. And as a result of that, what happens is they build the trust up again within the team. And one of the first things that the coach does is encourage them to work more collaboratively, more pair programming, more mob programming, or as I, I and Emily prefer to call it, ensemble work. Um, more patience. You don't have to be in a big rush. So MMMSS stands for many more, much smaller steps. Um, here is a link to probably the best entry point into the idea, but it's G. Paul Hill's um, terminology. It's not his idea. The idea of moving in small steps. There's lots and lots of people who talk about it, but he calls it MMMSS. And it's a real, the way that he phrases it and talks about it, I think is great. So I, I'd encourage you to look him up. And I use the phrase a lot, MMMSS. And for him, a step is moving from ready to ready. So from deployable tests passing to test passing deployable. Make those steps as small as possible. So you are moving from ready to ready. And that applies to code, but it also can apply to your journey if you're trying to implement new ways of doing things. OK. I ready for time. Um, so I've already talked about pair programming, so I'm going to skip past that. That should have been earlier, really. Oh, but but they also, as a result of the input from the, um, the coach, decide that they're going to do a lot more pairing. So they're going to work a lot more collaboratively. And as a result of this, they identify the obvious. I mean, you've probably, most of you have already worked out. They've only got manual tests. This has been a big problem all along. It's time to sort this out. So they start using test-driven development, which means that no 
line of code is written without there already being a test. The tests are written first. And another effect of that is that they now have an automated test suite automatically. They also start refactoring on a regular basis. So constantly, all the time, they're refactoring. And now they have an automated test suite. But their code is really tightly coupled. It's not well factored. It's not well architected. And this means that their builds are really slow. Because every time one bit of the code base needs rebuilding, the whole code base needs rebuilding because it's so tightly coupled. So the next thing they do is start to refactor the code base and re-architect the code base so that it's loosely coupled, so that they're minimizing the dependencies. And that speeds up the build time. Because if you want everything to go through a pipeline and potentially out to the world, or at least be checked, you need fast builds. Uh, and as uh, they say in the Accelerate book, for those who haven't come across it, um, Accelerate was written by Nicole Forsgren and a bunch of other people, including Jess Humble, um, based on the DORA reports, which are published once a year, which are really extensive uh, bits of research, probably arguably the most scientific bit of research, ongoing research about software development del and delivery. Um, it's very rigorous. They publish these annual reports. Report. The book is about what they've learned. And one of the things that they've learned, surprise, surprise, is that continuous integration is a much more effective way of doing software development. Anyway, so what they say, when they say continuous integration, they mean that your code is being integrated with the main, with the rest of the code, the, the code base several times a day. At least once a day is what they say. They do allow for the possibility of short-lived branches, but I would argue it's better if you don't have them. But what they say is that continuous integration requires relentless work to simplify systems architecture. So this is the thing about keeping things loosely coupled, keeping things well factored, because you want your builds to be fast. Um, so they minimize the dependencies. Um, but now, because their code is very modular, but their tests are not incremental. Their tests have slowed down because what's happening is um, every time they deploy, they have to run the whole test suite in this, in this pipeline. And because there are more modules, there's actually more tests now. Uh, and this has now slowed down. But they're not running their tests incrementally. And what I mean by that is that for instance, I have a tool called nCrunch, so I work in .NET. I have nCrunch running constantly in the background. It's running all of the tests, not all of the tests, all of the time. That's the point. It can detect which tests need to be rerun, and it only runs those rather than running the whole suite of tests every time I make a tiny change in my code. So, um, it, but, because, but they don't have this at the moment, so they just go, well, there you go. The tests are going to be slower. Never mind. We wanted to minimize dependencies. But because the tests are slow, when they fail, people just ignore it because they can't be bothered running the whole thing again. There isn't time. So never mind. We'll, we'll fix it later. So people get out of the habit of running the tests all the time, and they start ignoring failed builds. Um, and that causes problems. Um, so because people are ignoring the tests, that means that um, failing code is actually finding its way all the way into production. Bugs are going up. So they start using a, a tool that allows them to only run the tests that need to be run on their machines as they're working. That speeds them up again, makes it more likely that they will run the tests. Um, but because now the tests on the server are really fast, people are like, oh, I don't really need to run them on my machine. I can just push this code and the server will sort it out for me. So they're not running the tests locally before they push their code. Uh, and that means that the build is failing because they hadn't checked first locally whether the tests were going to fail. Um, but they're too busy. They don't want to be thinking about that. So they start leaving a broken build and not swarming on it. And now, because the build is broken, they can't deploy a critical patch. So they say, OK, we need to always be running our tests locally and keeping the build green. So yet another very useful habit. Run the test locally before you push to the server. And if the build fails, it's everybody's priority to make it green again. Um, but. 
some people aren't pushing very frequently. So what they're doing is they're doing a bunch of code on their own machine, but they're not pushing it to the server. So you can do trunk-based development and still have merge hell. Because effectively, even if you're working on the main branch and so are your colleagues over there, you're pulling from the main branch and working on your local copy of the main branch, and that's like having a branch. And if you do that for a week and don't merge it back into the main branch and your colleagues do the same, well, you may as well be working in a feature branch. So this is what happens in this team, that they're not pushing very frequently. So they're still getting merge hell when they finally do because they're having to merge with more stuff. So we get back to the idea of MMMSS, not just in your journey, but also in your code. You're moving from ready to ready in tiny steps. And every time your code tests are passing, you're pushing back to the main line. And because you're working in the main branch, the merge is automatic. You can't actually push to GitHub and, until you've pulled if you're pushing to a particular branch. So you have to merge. Um, and as Trisha G says, integrating small changes regularly into your code is usually less painful than a big merge at the end of a longer period of time. Now, what some people think when they hear about uh, trunk-based development is, oh my God, I'm just going to be merging constantly, and I hate merging. Merging's horrible. Um, and there will sometimes be merge conflicts. It can still happen. But if you're only merging after really small time periods and really small amounts of code, the chance of merge conflicts is much smaller. Merge conflicts can actually be dealt with sometimes by just throwing away what you just did and doing, replaying it on top of the new code because you did such a small amount. You're not losing anything by doing that. Um, or it's much easier to fix the merge conflicts because you can see very clearly what's changed. And also, the chances of problems being introduced is smaller. And if they are introduced, you can see exactly where the problem came from because it's such a small amount of code that you're dealing with. Um, so I like to talk about continuous trunk-based development purely to specify, make it very clear that I'm not talking about everybody working on the same branch, but holding the code on their own machine for a week at a time. Because technically, that is trunk-based development, but that's not continuous. So I, to make it really, really clear, I say continuous trunk-based development. So you are merging your code back into the main branch several times a day. Um, but you're still going to have minor merge issues. And as, as I said, you can just throw stuff away when that happens because it's so recently what you've done that you can just replay it. And often, if you're prepared to throw things away, you get um, the, the second time you do it, you do it better. Like throwing things away is a really useful habit to get into. So, what have we learned? Why does trunk based development make things better? Um, so a lot of these benefits are also the requisite skills. So you need to move in small steps in order to do continuous trunk-based development. But it's also a benefit because moving in small steps makes you much more agile. And I'll let G. Paul wax lyrical about that. Go and look him up. He's got lots and lots of reasons for why MMMSS is a really good idea. You get fast feedback on the changes that you make. You avoid merge hell. You reduce risk because every change is small, every problem is small, and every problem is easy to recover from. You've got faster integration. You've got fewer queues. You've got collective ownership. It's a highly collaborative working style, and you've got better quality code. And there's plenty of evidence in the DORA reports uh, and the uh, Accelerate book. There you go. That's DORA. Um, so, uh, and as they say, uh, this was 2022's report, so last year, trunk-based development has been shown for years to accelerate software delivery velocity. So, summary of all the techniques. Uh, this is another ex-colleague of mine. He says, we use branches when we don't mob or when we modify shared code and nobody likes it because they're so used to not working with branches. Uh, that, and it tends to happen in their team if they haven't been mobbing, but because they don't like working in branches, that actually encourages them to mob more. Um, Dave Farley says, any form of branching runs counter in principle to the ideas of continuous integration. Don't branch, don't branch, don't branch. He said that, not me. I'm not the boss of you. 
Okay, so um, feature flags, I'm just going to very quickly mention because feature flags is what some people use to handle the fact that they don't have feature branches. They think, well, if I'm making this thing and it's not even finished yet, because obviously you are going to be pushing code that's not finished. You're going to be pushing features that are not finished, as in, you know, they're not done. Um, and so some people use feature flags to handle that, which means that effectively their code bases are full of conditionals that are saying, well, if this thing's turned on, do this. If this thing's turned on, do this. It gets very messy very quickly. And you don't have to. You can write modular, well-factored code that is not visible to the end user. So you can use feature flags in your UI, but you don't have to use feature flags in your code base. Your code can be passing tests and, and, and working each tiny bit of it works. It's just not visible. It's not being used by the user interface. And Gpor again, he says, to get maximum bang for your trunk-based development book, all developers all the time should be running with 100% of the features turned on. A great deal of the benefit of continuous integration and trunk-based development, both, is in the extensive pre-testing workout the code gets as it's used by the rest of your team. So that's just a note on feature flags. Um, these are the, the, the things that I think I've said. Don't use branches. Um, but... But no, I'll come, I'll come to the book. I'm going to start with saying don't use branches. Have interactive code reviews where you're reviewing the code constantly because there's more than one pair of eyes. But when you do review the code, you do it holistically and you do it as a team or at least as a pair so you can have conversations about it. Avoid pull requests. Get help. Avoid guilt and shame. Be open and honest about what you're doing and why you're doing it. Avoiding the blame really helps with that as well. People are allowed to make mistakes and ask for help. It's OK. Build trust, collaborate, be patient. Implement automated testing, extremely important. Minimize dependencies, speed up your tests. You need a fast suite of tests because otherwise you're increasing friction and people just won't run them. Uh, or they'll delay integration because they don't want the pain of waiting for the tests. Use incremental testing. So tests that, that, that use tools that can detect which tests need to be run when you've made a small change. Keep the build green. Build and test on your own machine before you push to a remote server. Um, have Use many more, much smaller steps in everything you do. Push your code frequently. Use test-driven development. Refactor frequently. And if you need to, throw things away. But you can do some of those things without doing all of them. So even if you don't want to or are not, or are not ready to do trunk-based development, a lot of the things that I've talked, all of the things that I've talked about are all really useful software development techniques. So maybe you don't do test-driven development. Maybe that's your first step. Maybe you don't have an automated test suite. Maybe your tests run really slowly. Maybe your builds are really slow. Maybe you don't have an automated pipeline. All of those things are candidates for a starting point. And you, maybe you just work on one of those things. And maybe you only ever work on one of those things. But any one of those things will improve your software delivery. So a bunch of links to uh, things that I've talked about, um, books that I've talked about, more links. Uh, you'll see the one at the top there is my report on trunk-based development. So I've written a whole great um, piece, a report for O'Reilly, which was published a few weeks ago and is available on the O'Reilly learning platform. You do need an O'Reilly subscription in order to read it. You can sign up for a free trial, read it, and then run away. Um, but it's there on the O'Reilly learning platform. Uh, I also hosted a podcast, uh, as you mentioned. Uh, there are 27 episodes uh, that were hosted by me, or maybe 25, actually, because I had a co-host for a couple of them. Um, loads of, every episode is an interview with an interesting industry professional about an interesting topic, uh, and there are uh, a few in there that are relevant to today. So there was one with Daniel Turhill's North on when is a test not a test. There was one with G. Paul Hill on test-driven developments, one with Emily Bates on refactoring. There's one with John Skeet on coding for fun. That was a different talk. Anyway, still a good episode. Right, uh, this is the report that I talked about. That link uh, there will get you to it, but um, you'll also be able to get to it in these slides. This is a quality code boot camp that I'm running for O'Reilly every Wednesday in July, starting on Wednesday the 5th, which is next week. 
Um, uh, it's afternoons UK time, so and European time. Uh, in the UK time, it's 1 p.m. till 5 p.m., which I think, uh, no, I can't do the time zone maths, um, but it's in the afternoons on Wednesdays. Um, and you do need a subscription to the O'Reilly Learning Platform to do that, but that's going to be hands-on techniques. It's going to be mostly focused around refactoring. Uh, and finally, um, I help teams to improve their software delivery. If you would like some technical coaching, um, come and see me. Those are all my contact details. I also do keynotes and run workshops. Thank you.